Oh Lord, we want you to walk with us. We ask that your presence would be our guide right now. Lord, when we turn to Scripture, often we sense a distance. There are obstacles that we encounter when we read Scripture. For some of us, especially when we look at an Old Testament passage where there is such great cultural distance, uh, there are times that we don't hear, we don't listen, we don't understand. But Lord, if you walk with us right now, if your Holy Spirit is present in our hearts and minds, guiding us, leading us, speaking to us, then we know that we will hear. And so open our hearts and minds to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, the last few weeks, we have been looking at the book of Amos. Amos, the book, is named after uh, the prophet who wrote it, Amos. And uh, he lives in uh, the, the southern kingdom of Israel. At this point in history, the kingdom of Israel is divided into two. We have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Uh, the northern kingdom at this point is uh, corrupt. There's a lot of injustice and uh, the worship of false gods. And so Amos is called by God in the first verse of the book to go from the south to the north and give warnings and prophecy and sermons and all that sort of thing to the northern kingdom. Now, Amos is a shepherd. He is a uh, farmer. So he's basically a business owner. He has no formal training in this task of prophecy, and some did, but he did not. And yet he goes and he brings this, this message from God to the northern kingdom. And, uh, and, and we've been exploring that over the last, over the last few weeks. Now, at this point in the book of Amos, where we're at now, we're in a, a collection of sermons that Amos preaches, and he does that in a particular place. We'll talk about in a, uh, in a moment. But as he is, uh, is preaching and, and, and teaching, there are times in the midst of these sermons that Amos speaks for God. And so he actually is speaking in the first person where God is directly speaking to the people. That's how we encounter parts of Amos, including the part that we're going to look at today. And so hear the word of God from Amos chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. And today we'll also hear uh, one of the most famous Bible verses that we know, um, certainly the high point of the book of Amos. Hear God's word. God says through Amos, I am hate. I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs." I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So at this point, when Amos is speaking, there is a king in the north. This king is named Jeroboam II. And Jeroboam is not a good king in the eyes of God. He's done very well for the kingdom in some particular ways. He's created tremendous prosperity for the kingdom. He has expanded the kingdom. He's gained a lot of, of land for the kingdom. So there's great prosperity. There's great security. But the problem with Jeroboam is that he is also perpetrating great injustices against the people. Because as the kingdom is expanded and this land is, is being accumulated, Jeroboam is giving the land to the people that have supported him. He passes this wealth on to a select few. And as this goes, and, and several of these, uh, or, or, or some of these people in this class, this gathering of people around jo Jeroboam, they, they become wealthier and wealthier. 
There's agriculture and there's trade. And so Jeroboam too is, is taxing those. And again, that prosperity goes to a select few. And as that prosperity, that expansion builds, there is also a, 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 an underclass or a poor class that is building that is also being exploited by the rich. They are sold into debt slavery. They are uh, not represented in the justice system. We've talked about that in the, in the past weeks. But Jeroboam has nurtured this injustice that Amos is speaking against. But another thing that's happening is that the worship life of the northern kingdom is also corrupt. They've included the worship of, of foreign gods in their temples. Uh, there's one major temple in the northern kingdom. It's called Bethel, and it's near the border, and that's where Amos goes. Amos goes to this temple at Bethel, and most of his sermons, and probably this one, is spoken at that temple in Bethel. There's another major temple in the northern kingdom uh, way up north called Dan, but where Amos is is in this temple at, at Bethel. Now, this temple has a history because the first king that split the kingdom, this was a long time ago, his name was also Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam I. He splits the kingdom. He starts this temple in Bethel, and he puts a golden calf in this temple. That's a Canaanite god, and probably that, the worship of the Canaanite gods is still taking place all these years later at the Bethel temple. So there's Baal worship, and there's just this mix. There is some Hebrew worship going on, but it's also been corrupted by the worship of all of these false gods. And so we've got worship of false gods happening in the northern kingdom, and we've got all this injustice happening in the northern kingdom, and the combination of those two things, this false worship and this injustice, is corrupting what's happening at the temple so badly that God doesn't want it. They're worshiping in a way that God doesn't want. They're giving something God doesn't want. It's corrupted. I'm a, not a huge Simpsons fan, but there are moments in The Simpsons that I really appreciate. And uh, one scene I have always remembered, and some of you might remember this too, is when Homer takes Marge and the family and Marge's sisters come too. They all go out to a restaurant to celebrate Marge's birthday. And the time comes for Homer to give Marge his uh, present that he has brought her. And he, he picks up this box about this big that's nicely wrapped, and he holds it out over the cake and says something like, here you go, Marge, happy birthday. And as he's holding it, a bowling ball falls out of the, the present and lands on the cake and spills everywhere. And as that happens, you notice that the bowling ball has Homer's name on it. And Marge says something like, I don't remember exactly, but she says something like, Homer, are you giving me a bowling ball with your name on it for my birthday? I don't even bowl. And he says, he says, well, if you don't want it, I know someone who does. <laughs> that's the kind of worship that's happening at this Bethel temple. They are giving God something that God doesn't want. It might be something that they want, but this is not what God wants. They're giving God a bowling ball with their name on it. And so what does God think of that? What does God think of this worship that's happening at Bethel? Well, Amos tells us, beginning at verse 21, he says, God says, I hate it. I hate. I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, these are all acts of worship that they're doing in Bethel. God says, I will not look upon. This is the strongest language possible. It's as harsh as possible. It is as cutting as possible. God hates this. He despises this. He cannot stand it. Amos says, God takes no delight in it. One of these acts of worship that they do, this burnt offering, it was like a, a peace offering, and they would burn this, this, this offering, and it would float up to God, and it smelled really good. But when Amos writes that God despises that, in the Hebrew, he's talking about odor. It's not a fragrant offering. It doesn't smell good to God. If we were translating this differently, it would be absolutely justified to say that God is telling them that their worship stinks. 
I have no regard for this, God says. Literally, he doesn't even want to look at it. He wants to turn away. God is, it's this revulsion that God is experiencing. He can't stomach it. It is a stench and it is a horrible sight, this, this worship that is not what God wants. It's full of injustice and it is uh, directed toward false gods. Condemnation that Amos is bringing to them, judgment, warning. But there is this tiny little bit of hope We have a lot of hope, but in Amos right here, there's a tiny little bit of hope. There's a glimmer of hope. Amos actually says, in a way, they could change this. They actually could fix this. Worship doesn't have to be this way. And so he tells them what they need to do. Now, we don't know that he really expects them to do it. And looking back, we know that they didn't because the northern kingdom is destroyed 40 years later. This uh, punishment that Amos is talking to them about in other passages does come to pass. But nonetheless, Amos gives them an opportunity. They could change this worship. It could be something that God would like. It could be something that God would appreciate. And in order to change it, Amos tells them what I think, and I think you'll think this too, he tells them something that is an absolutely mind-blowing truth. Worship and justice are tied together. False worship obstructs justice, and injustice obstructs worship. It goes both ways. These things are essential to each other. First of all, let's talk about the last verse that Amos gives us, because that's the verse where we discover that injustice in our lives, injustice in the lives of the people at Bethel, injustice in the northern kingdom, that is obstructing worship. They can't have good worship because outside of worship, they are exploiting the poor. They are are hurting the underrepresented. They are doing these things that God does not want them to do. And they can't go outside in their lives and live that way and then turn around and worship. That is not acceptable to God. And so Amos says, instead of doing that, instead of living these lives of injustice and then trying to worship, instead of that, in verse 24... He says, but instead, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now, we've heard Amos say that word justice a few times. I've mentioned before, that's the Hebrew word mishpat, and we translate that most often as justice. And in many contexts, that's a perfect translation. It does correlate, mishpat correlates to our concept of justice in most ways, uh, but it's different too. The Hebrew concept of justice, the justice that we see in God is more than our concept of justice. It's deeper than our concept of justice. But today, and Amos has done this in his, in his book already, but we, we haven't looked at this until now, Amos couples the word justice with the word righteousness. And that coupling happens all over Scripture. Mishpat, justice, and tzedakah, righteousness. Judgment, justice, and righteousness. He says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And that coupling of those two words give us some insight into even even deeper insight into what the justice of God looks like. In some ways, those two words are synonymous, especially when they're coupled, but there are nuances that are different. But when they're coupled, and oftentimes when they're not coupled, even then when they are used, there is this uh, uh, layer to them that we've already seen that includes care for the poor, care for the underrepresented, care for the oppressed. It's all over the Old Testament, not just here in Amos, but certainly it is here in Amos. This justice, this righteousness, Amos wants this to be something that is just going to pour forth. It's going to gush. It's like water, rolling like water. It's like an ever-flowing stream. 
This area that they lived in, it, streams didn't necessarily flow all year long. They would dry up, but this one is an ever-flowing stream, and it is essential for the life and faith of Israel. Just like water, we need water to live. Israel, in order to live for God the way it is called to be this covenant people for God, Israel has to have justice and righteousness flowing all the time. It's essential for their life, and it's not a, a scarce thing or shouldn't be a scarce thing. It's not an intermittent thing. It has to be constant and abundant, flowing, rolling water of justice. and care for the poor, and care for the underrepresented, and care for the oppressed, and righteousness. Now those two concepts, mishpat and tzedakah, justice and righteousness, there are some subtle differences. When we're talking about justice in scripture, we're often talking about these concrete actions that we use to create fairness. Uh, That is how God lives, that's how God how, the, how God's people live for him. It's these actions that these, they take to create fairness. That's justice. That's mishpat. But tzedakah, righteousness, is more like a characteristic of God. It's like the quality of, of fairness. It's like being right. It's kind of the ethical component of, of what justice looks like. Justice, living for God, carrying out that care for the the poor and the oppressed. Righteousness, affirming that characteristic of who God is. And always those concepts, mishpat and, and tzedakah, they are always related to love and grace. They're not related to punishment. Now, We read about punishment happening a lot, especially in the book of Amos. We've seen that. But that punishment is related to the only when there is no love and grace connected with justice and righteousness. Paul, the apostle in Romans, talks about when he talks about justice, he uses this concept of justice when he talks about God bringing the Gentiles into the covenant. So God saving the Gentiles is an act of God's justice. But it's not, when Paul writes, because the Gentiles deserved it. It's not because they worked so hard to get God's justice or that they had it coming. That corresponds more to our concept of justice. But God's concept of justice is this gift he gives to the Gentiles of grace and love. That is part of the concept of God's justice, not deserving, but but mercy. Last week, I mentioned that you know that Greek statue of, of, of justice? It's that woman holding the scales and she's got a blindfold. And last week we talked about that being, uh, you know, that she does that because she's impartial. She's objective and that's this image of justice. And I think that, that we relate to that image most of all. But in the Old Testament, if we were to sculpt a statue, it would not be that. In God's justice, that statue would look different. Instead of someone holding a scales with a blindfold, this person would have their eyes open and they would be reaching down trying to help someone who has fallen on the ground, is poor and is in need. And then with the other hand, they would be pushing back the oppressor, holding back what that person is doing out of selfish ambition or to to, uh, aggrandize themselves. That is the image of this, this statue that would represent the justice of God. And the other image that, of course, we represent, that represents the justice of God is the cross. I mean, when we look at that cross, that is God's justice. That is God reaching down to help someone who is poor and in need, who is sinful like us and needs the help of God and pushing back and holding back the evil, even the evil that we deserve. That's Jesus Christ on the cross. That is mishpat. That is tzedakah, the righteousness of God being imparted in this just way full of grace and love. That's what justice and and righteousness are all about. 
And as we or the people in the Bethel area, the people in the northern kingdom, as they live that out, as they know God more and more, as they're being like God by bringing justice, not injustice, they discover that is really the only way to worship. Perpetrating injustice distances them from God. They don't even know God or who he is. And because righteousness is part of his very character, they can't even hope to worship. There's no way they can worship when they are perpetrating injustice. That that is how injustice obstructs worship. But the opposite is also true. False worship obstructs justice. God says through Amos, he mentions specifically the music and the prayers during their worship services. He says, take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. Earlier when he talked about solemn assemblies, that's actually, a, I don't think, a great way to translate the Hebrew there because their solemn assemblies were actually jubilant and they were joy-filled. They, the harps that get mentioned here in this verse too, they aren't really harps. They're a, a different instrument. We don't really know what it was. It would have as much in common with a guitar as with a harp. And so you can imagine the, the joy that was taking place or the loudness that was taking place in these worship services. But because that worship is often directed to false gods, they don't know God. And so they don't know justice. That's his character. God doesn't want that kind of music. God doesn't want that kind of worship. And it's not just music. One of the words that Amos uses here is the same word for the Psalms. And so he's talking about prayers as well and other activities in worship. So it turns out that the best criteria for having good worship is that it leads to justice. So when you come to a worship service, what do you you think when it's over? What are the kinds of questions that you ask? Maybe you're in the car talking to people in your car. Maybe you just are in the uh, fellowship hall or later on in the week you're you're thinking about it. But when we leave, and I do this too, when we leave a, a worship service, what do we think about? Do we evaluate the music? Was the music technically correct? Did we enjoy it? Was it our style? Did you agree with what the pastor said? Did you disagree? Did what the pastor say make you feel good about yourself? Or did what the pastor say uh, was a challenge in some way or something that you weren't super comfortable hearing? These are the sorts of criteria, and we have some others too, that we might think of when we think, was that a good worship service? Did I, did I enjoy that? Did I engage with that? Well, Amos has a completely different criteria here for what makes good worship. His criteria is that it leads to justice. That's a new idea, I think, for many of us. Is the worship that we're experiencing right now, is it going to change us? Are we going to carry out justice because we've heard about God's grace and mercy? If it doesn't, if we're not hearing about this justice of God, if we're not hearing about Jesus Christ, if it's false worship, then it is going to obstruct justice. That's what Amos is teaching us. These concepts of justice and righteousness and worship, they are so intertwined. When Kathy and I uh, had uh, younger kids, we did what most families seem to be doing, and we had the minivan, uh, you know, that was our minivan stage. We got, I think it was a Honda Odyssey, and uh, one day I was driving this Honda Odyssey, and it had a compass in it. It showed you what direction you were going, and this was a long time ago. That was the first car we'd ever had a compass in, and I think that was kind of new technology at the time uh, because one day it stopped working. And so I looked in the manual, and I had to look up, like, what do you do when the compass is blinking these dashes? It's not working. And it said that you were supposed to drive the car around in circles. <laughs> You're supposed to drive in 360 degrees. And so I did. I found a big parking lot, and I just started driving in a circle. And sure enough, the compass started working again. That was how you had to recalibrate or reset the compass. Amos, 
is showing us here that when we stand up for the poor and the oppressed, when we do justice, we are resetting our internal compass and we are pointing our hearts to God. And that enables us to worship him because we know him by doing justice, by doing what he does. And the opposite is also true, that every time we really worship God, we are pointing our souls to true north. And we can do that because in worshiping God, we also get to know him. And when we do that, when we get to know him, we can't help but love the poor. And we know that he loves us in our need as well. And so that's why justice is tied to worship, and it's why worship is tied to justice. Amen.